Good to see everybody. This is definitely the biggest um, room of product leaders I've ever seen put together, so that's great. A lot of energy here, a lot of great discussion so far. So excited to be here. Um, we're going to talk a little bit today about um, multi-product ecosystems. So I've had the fortune of working with a couple companies that have built truly generational multi-product ecosystems. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what goes into that. Um, as many of you know, when companies start, the first and foremost thing is to find product market fit with the first product. Everybody's driving at that. And it's a magical moment when you realize it. The gist of this talk is going to be about what happens next. How do you sort of leverage the success of the first product to unlock the second product, the third product, and so on and so forth to truly build a generational company? So some of you might be at this stage now in your product career. Some of you might be at this stage later on. I hope, I hope it's helpful to you kind of to think about this stage of, of company building. Um, so just really quickly, uh, real quick on me. So currently uh, uh, Chief Product Officer at Gusto. Um, where I've been for the last two years. As many of you know, Gusto provides payroll benefits and HR solutions to SMBs. We have about 300,000 SMBs on the platform today. Um, since we started in 2011, we've moved about a trillion dollars, which is like crazy to say, in payroll uh, dollars. Um, for me, I've been building products for 25 years. I started off as an engineer. Um, I was coached very early in my career that I asked too many questions about, why are we doing this? And, the competitors are doing that. Why don't we try that? And so somebody sat me down and said, you might want to try product management. I said, yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. So I uh, couldn't have picked anything better, and I was glad I was told that. Um, so the last 10 years, I've spent uh, most of my time at Square and Gusto. And Square and Gusto uh, are similar in lots of ways. With, uh, the last two years at Gusto and eight at Square previously, both have built multi-product ecosystems. Um, at Square, when I started, it was still just one product, and I got to watch it go from one product to when I left about 25 products that I worked together for small businesses, and Gusto is on a similar path. And so the gist of today's talk is going to kind of hone in on some of the insights from that journey that's hopefully leverageable for you on your journey. Um, so there's sort of three acts to today's talk. The first, I'm going to talk about the importance of the first product. Product market fit is a must. But then there's some other conditions on how the first product needs to hit that sort of sets the stage for product two, three, four, 10, 20, so on and so forth. Act two, I'll talk about how you leverage those advantages. So what are some of the things you can take from product one or product two that's happened before and leverage that to build subsequent products and how to really bring unfair advantage to subsequent products that results in outsized value for customers. And I'll talk a bit about Act 3, which is how the company needs to evolve and how the culture needs to evolve to support a multi-product ecosystem. It's just a different ballgame when you're building 20, 30 products versus building one. And so I'm going to share with you a few of the, the insights on that. Do you want me to use this? OK. OK. Is this better? All right. Sorry about that, guys. Um, I'm not going to start over, but hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you heard most of the first few slides. Um, okay, so act one here. We're going to talk about how the first product sort of sets up um, the foundation for subsequent products. And you're going to see a little bit of Pac-Man imagery throughout this. Pac-Man was my favorite video game growing up. How many people here played Pac-Man growing up? Okay, that was a secret question for how many people are over 40, which I am. So now I know the, the demographic of the room. All right. Um, so let's get into it. So this is a look at Square and Gusto today. Both have built strong multi-product ecosystems. Um, this is not how these companies started. So when you look at Square here, Square started with payments and point of sale. And based off those products, was able to layer on payroll, website development, team management, CRM, lots of things that sort of work all together to help a business succeed. Similarly, Gusto started with payroll. And based off payroll, we were able to move into time management, expense tracking, benefits, so on and so forth, all sort of working together. But when you go back in time and you think about how these companies started, they did not start as ecosystems. Many of you probably remember the launch of Square. It was very, very simple. It was basically plug a, a white reader into a telephone and allow you to swipe credit cards, which in hindsight seems kind of basic, but at the time this was truly revolutionary. This unlocked so many small businesses and individuals that previously didn't take credit cards. We look at Gusto. Gusto also wasn't an ecosystem on day one. Gusto was a very simple web app that helped you run payroll and do it much more simply than folks were doing it at the time. Many people were doing it through pen and paper, and those that were using companies like ADP and Paychex, the process was really arduous. You had to like 
fax information and make phone calls and all this stuff. And so it got way simpler um, when Gusto was launched. And so how did these sort of products set the stage for all the products that came afterwards? How did they get to the ecosystem? So a few insights to share. The first is that um, there was a large market at play with both, with a good amount of fragmentation. So the SMB market, as we all know, millions and millions of small businesses. If you include solopreneurs, there's something like 30 million that fall into the market. So a big market and also a lot of fragmentation. They're not all the same, um, which sort of sets the stage for subsequent products that can go after parts of that fragmentation. Um, both products solve the horizontal need. So everybody needs payroll. Everybody needs payments. It doesn't matter if you're a plumber, a lawyer, a landscaper, you're gonna have to pay your team and you're gonna have to need to take payments from customers. So both, both companies are able to sort of cut across this large market by, by um, uh, solving a horizontal need in payroll and in payments. The third, the third thing was it was a meaningful improvement over the status quo. So I gave a little bit of color on this a moment ago, but delivering something of uh, exceptional value right off the bat that sort of formulates the company's legitimacy in the eyes of the customer and sets them up as a company to trust, sets the stage for subsequent products. So with payments, as you, as you probably recall, you know, back in the day, small businesses had to file to get these machines sent to them. They had to fill out these contracts that they got locked in on. The pricing was super non-transparent. They had no idea sort of what they were paying when they took credit cards and Square sort of changed all that. And with Gusto, it unlocked all these consumers that previously were doing things by pen and paper to be able to use a sophisticated consumer level web app to get it done, which is both meaningful improvements. And then the last thing to share is uh, unique data capture. So when you uh, look at, at Square, you look at Gusto and sort of what's happening under the hood, on Square, you're getting all this payments information. So you have really good insight into the revenue of a small business, which could be leveraged later to build subsequent products. With Gusto, when you're signing up for payroll, in order to even use the product, you have to tell us who all your employees are and keep that up to date so you can pay them accurately. And so we've developed this understanding of the employee system of record, an employee graph, if you will, and we can use that in order to serve you with more uh, uh, products down the road. Okay, so act two. Act two, hopefully many of you that raised your hand have gotten to act two. This is after uh, three, three stages of Pac-Man. But in this talk, Act 2 is going to be about leveraging advantages to build the next set of products. And so every time I have a team that comes to me and starts pitching a new feature, pitching a new product, what I'm going to share with you here is what's sort of rattling around in the back of my head on are we taking advantage of things we've already done in order to sort of fuel our success um, on this next product? Said differently, are we consistently taking advantage of our existing position to deliver outsized value in a way that a startup or a point solution couldn't match? So let me talk to you a little bit about these, these things. The first one is awareness. So one massive advantage you have with product two, product three, product four, is the customers are already here and you can reach them in new ways. With product one, you have to go and pull customers out of the market. It's much more difficult to do from an acquisition standpoint. With subsequent products, you have the ability to use uh, many new interfaces, many new placements in order to, to bring awareness to your, to your product. And so a good example of this is our health insurance product at Gusto. You can see in this, this view here on the side um, that as you're adding a new team member, which is a natural thing that you will do when you're, when you're setting up payroll or adding new team members as your business expands, we can very naturally inform you that like, hey, you're hiring your sixth employee. And for a lot of businesses your size that are in your industry, they offer health benefits and we notice that you don't. And so we have a product for that. If you'd like to consider it, click here to learn more. This is a very tasteful way to bring awareness to a subsequent product um, and an advantage that you can leverage. The key here is to do this tastefully. You can obviously get carried away and we've all seen uh, products that do that where you've got advertisements kind of coming at you from every direction. But if done tastefully, this is an extreme advantage that all subsequent products should hopefully leverage. The second one to share with you is this all-in-one value proposition. And I've, I've been reminded of this time and time again throughout my career where <clears throat> you, you um, are able to launch a new solution, even if it's feature light and uh, customers really enjoy it because it's part of a tool that they already trust and they already use. And this gets back to the benefit of being able to launch something that's um, better than the status quo as the first product. So here's an example of time tracking. Um, time tracking at Gusto right now is very mature, very strong product. When it launched, it was fairly bare bones. Um, but a lot of people adopted it over third-party products because it works so well at the rest of Gusto. 
So the third thing is data integration. This is leveraging data generated from the foundational offering for subsequent offerings. And so you can see here with benefits, this ties into the employee system of record. It's very easy for somebody to add employees, update employees, and have that kind of um, show up for both payroll and for benefits because it's all based off the same data. And so the data integration just makes it so much easier for customers. This is a huge, huge tailwind um, when considering what, what sort of benefit uh, product to adopt versus outside options. And the last one, this is also a data one, um, but it's about leveraging unique insights from data in order to derive something new and novel for customers and being able to innovate off data you already have. Um, Square Capital, it's probably my favorite example of this, Square recognized early that we had really good insight into the health of a small business from the payment trends. We could see from payments sort of how healthy the revenue stream was. Based off that, we could underwrite better than others could with lending, and we could use that in order to spin up a product like Square Capital, um, which was super cool. So I'm always kind of looking for what unique insights are we leveraging for subsequent products. So to kind of recap these things, uh, these are the four things I'm, I'm looking for when I hear new product pitches. One, are we leveraging awareness? Two, are we leveraging the all-in-one value proposition? Three, are we leveraging data integration to do something unique? Um, and, and to make things very simple for the customer. And four, is there any unique insight that we're able to sort of bring for the customer uh, based off products we've already launched when we're thinking about a new product to launch? And oftentimes, you know, you'll, you'll hear pitches that kind of hit on a few of these. The, the home run is if you, if you get all four, but oftentimes um, it, it might be one or two. Okay. So let's talk about Act 3. Act 3, many of you maybe didn't make it to in Pac-Man. That's a little bit harder to get to this stage, but I couldn't even find a GIF for this, so it's a, just a static image. But Act 3 is how the, the company evolves to support a multi-ecosystem, multi-product uh, ecosystem. It's just a little bit of a different way to run the company. So I'm going to share a couple insights on this here to close. The first thing is that it's really a mindset shift um, when you're talking about products 2, 3, 4, and so on. There's a lot of singles and doubles, to use a uh, baseball analogy here, versus the first product, which is typically more of a home run. And what ends up happening, as this graph is showcasing, is that these products start to stack over time. As they launch, they contribute a little bit less than the first product, but their contribution stacks and stacks and stacks as you get product two, three, four, five, and six to hit, so that the company overall is up and to the right, even though each individual product underneath it, in addition to the first one, might not be kind of like knocking it out of the park at the same level that the main product did. And the insight on this is oftentimes for, you know, it's say an overactive executive team that's not used to seeing this kind of trend line, they might conclude that, hey, product two or product three is not contributing nearly at the level as product one. We should kill it. It's not worth doing it. All, you know, only going after sort of home runs, if you will. And that would be a bad uh, way to go about things. And what I've learned over time is that what you want to see is some sort of framework that allows you to create clarity for the company on what to expect from subsequent products. So first off, just making it clear that the ICP is a little bit smaller. This is what you're going to see in terms of contribution that's meaningful. And we need to do that repeatedly in order to get this sort of up to the right pattern. And things like the Three Horizons framework from McKinsey is one we use at Gusto, where we can be very clear on like, hey, for a new product that's in, say, a Horizon 3 zone, we're not sort of expecting massive contribution off the bat. It's something that'll come over time, but we need to nurture it and, and, and ultimately get it to start to contribute, even if that won't quite be at the same level as the main product. Um, three other things to kind of leave you with before we close here. Uh, the first is that as, as you go on, you know, in your, your building product one, uh, I'm talking about design systems, sort of the, fir the first box on this, this slide. Um, there really is no design system. The design is the first product. That's kind of what you, you base it all on. But when you're building product number 20, product number 30, design systems get massively important. And the reason for that is for a lot of, a lot of companies that I've, I've been a part of, uh, really, really base a lot of their value in simplicity and in good UX and good user experience. And for the customer, we don't really want them to feel a lot of difference if they're using product 19 or using product one. We want it to all kind of feel consistent, like it's one gusto, or when I was at Square, one square. Design systems help make that real. And so investment in this has to sort of start to scale up as you're getting, getting higher in product count. Um, the second big thing to call out is platforms. So in the beginning, there really aren't a lot of platforms. And oftentimes, platforms can be a tax to kind of get spun up until they actually aren't. And then they're highly leverageable in order to allow you to, to, to scale multiple products. So when I was at Square, you know, we had this wonderful 
um, payment platform team that built this rock solid payment platform that I didn't have to know at all how money moved. I just know I could call this thing and I'd say, hey, move money from here to here and it just moved. And so we could spin up so many transaction products on top of that so quickly. Um, that was such an accelerant for us. And so building platforms over core assets at, at Square, of course, that was, that was payments. At Gusto, it's the employee system of record. So it's bulletproof and it can be used and leveraged with multiple products um, becomes key. And then the third one is a little, little bit more touchy-feely, but hopefully you guys all know what I mean, in good taste, in good product culture. So I gave you one example with, in a, with awareness, where if you're not using good taste to make decisions, you can kind of pollute the ecosystem, put too many ads in there. That's an example of not using good taste. Um, when, you, when you have sort of this thought pattern of how do we leverage advantages ingrained into the product culture, you start seeing you know, pitches show up already talking about advantages. And you start seeing you know, three-year plans show up that already talk about leveraging advantages. And the, the whole organization starts to scale because the culture is in the mindset on how do we actually create um, a multi-product ecosystem. So just to recap, so um, the first product success is critical. Ideally, it's in a large, large market, um, and it generates unique data, unique capabilities. As you're, as you're looking forward to products two and beyond, you always want to think about this better together thesis. What are the advantages that we can tap into to make sure the second product and so on and so forth are successful? And finally, there's some key ways that the company, the culture needs to evolve to succeed. And this is what we have for you today. So thank you very much. Um, if you like this kind of stuff, if you like small businesses, we're hiring gusto.com slash careers. We'd love to work with any of you. And I'll be around if you want to talk in person later today. So thank you so much for having me.